Footage has started pouring in following the sudden and still unexplained opening up of wormholes leading to uncharted systems. As the fragmentary information from explorers starts coming together, it looks like there are multiple systems containing enormous hive-like structures similar to those reported by the late Hillen Tukos. These hives are surrounded by sleeper enclaves filled with bodies. It's not clear if all the structures were built together at the same time, or if hives were built later in an effort to harvest the corpses contained within the enclaves. The body of Hillen Tukos was discovered and examined by Lucas Raholan while taking part in an Ikame-led expedition into wormhole J174618. This location has also been confirmed as the one seen in the final broadcast made by Tukos. While J174618 and the other systems all contain formidable drifter presence, there is still no sign of the massive armada seen in the Tukos recording, and that is certainly a matter of great concern to all the people of New Eden. This is Lena Amber reporting for The Scope. Welcome to Hydrostatic Eve lore panel for Drifters Incursions. I am your host, Ashtarothi, and I am joined, as always, by my two co-hosts, Locked Fox and Phyridian. Phyridian has once again traveled far and wide to find the, the best minds in lore um, and bring them for you to discuss the current ongoings. And, and man, has, uh, has the lore been ramping up in the last couple of months. Um, so, Fi, why, without further ado, why don't you introduce our panel? Man, we've got a, a great panel for you today, a lot of familiar faces. Um, we have Uriel, who is an archivist and emergent event analyst at JLab. Uh, he's deeply invested in the lore and specifically in the Jove and Sleeper history. Uh, we have General Stargazer, um, who is the CEO of FCORD and operator of the Live Events Channel and Live Events Fleets. Um, he's been attending live events since 2004 and has a current focus on investigating the drifters. Don't we all? Um, we have Makoto back, uh, who is the CEO of Itsukame Zaino, uh, a lore and exploration-focused corporation. Uh, he's generally drifter savvy and has had some run-ins with Concord, and uh, he wants to remind you that uh, Ikame is recruiting. We have Morwin back, uh, CEO of uh, Tyrathleon Interstellar, a small RP and lore fo uh, and PVE-focused corporation in Rote Capel. He's an Eric Jalan archivist and lore generalist, and he helps run a number of RP community venues in including the OOC forums at Backstage, uh, which is backstage.eve-inspiracy.com. We have Mark726, uh, a general lore dude and author of Eve Travel and the Eve Lore Survival Guide. Um, and we have Ravis, author of the Interstellar Privateer blog, uh, Shattered Planet, Wormhole Lore, and Tinfoil Hattery Specialist. He's a member of the C5 Wormhole Alliance Sleeper Social Club. And then joining us for the first time, uh, we have Samira Kerner, uh, at Samira Kerner on Twitter. Uh, she's an Amarian lore expert and member of PIE, Eve's oldest Amar Loyalist Corporation. Um, and joining her from uh, PIE uh, is Admiral Ascentior, uh, who is a director of PIE Incorporated, um, and he is the Honorary Fabricator General of the Imperial Navy. So, so welcome to all of our panelists. Awesome. Very thank, th you. thank you all for coming. So uh, today we're going to touch on some very specific topics. Uh, we want to address kind of uh, the, the events that have been going on for the last month and more importantly, uh, put those into context and kind of look into what we're going to in the future. So uh, some of the topics that we're going to cover is uh, information about Jamil. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we, we brought on our Pi fellows is because, um, you know, obviously some pretty big events have been going on with Jamil, so we'll touch on those. Uh, also, uh, we know that drifter incursions are coming, so we're going to discuss that, what it means, uh, what it might mean for the lore, and, and how it might be implemented. And then um, more information about the Jove, including uh, Jovian, the Jovian Stargates. Um, we, we've collected some more information about the, the Jovian Stargate situation. Um, and then uh, also some more of the exploration of the drifter, uh, drifter sites, so the discovery of the drifter hives, and 
uh, the current uh, ongoing arc with Tukas. So, uh, but before we get to all of that, um, really, really exciting stuff, we do have some housekeeping to get to. So, Fi, why don't you, uh, why don't you start out with that? Yeah, uh, first of all, an update on uh, our Patreon. Uh, we have not produced any content in July, so if you would like a, a refund, we sent you a message, um, and we will happily refund your, your money for July. Um, but we are going to be putting out a bunch of content in August. Um, so we have episode 24 uh, will be coming out next week. We're obviously doing this uh, this lore panel today, and we'll have a special announcement uh, about something that will be coming in August at the end of the lore panel. Uh, so stick with us for that. Yep, and we're going to do our best to not spoil it throughout the entire next two hours. So it'll be hard, but we do have something really big to announce at the end of the uh, the cast. So let's see if we can make it. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's move on. So let's start with, uh, with what's going on with Jamil Sorum. So we've talked about Jamil in the very first hydrostatic lore panel. Uh, we, the, the focus of the first hydrostatic lore panel was to kind of talk about all of the movers and shakers in the lore that we feel is relevant. And one of those that definitely came up was Jamil. Although at that time, we knew a lot less than we know now. That was before the Drifters showed up. That was before... Uh, anything else. So I think it's probably a really good time to, especially since what's been going on, to kind of circle back on her and see what's going on. So uh, Samira, why don't you catch us up to speed about kind of where where Jamil is at right now? Okay, so basically uh, Jamil has been reported as not in the public light for the last basically like a year or so. Um and recently, in the last uh, few months, or rather the last two months, I guess, she's suddenly appeared in two separate events. Uh, one at uh, Safazon during the, uh, to uh, bless the, the queue laying of the Octoritas, which is a new Abaddon, uh, highly advanced Abaddon, that is going to be the flagship of the Imperial fleet. And then she also appeared at Mechios in Sarum Prime to uh, to uh, basically celebrate the previous battles there, the one uh, between uh, herself and the Minmitar in uh, a few years ago, as well as the CVA uh, celebration just this just this year um yeah she's been definitely giving, that, sorry uh she's been definitely giving a lot of credit to to the uh player actors uh she's made it a point to kind of compliment pi and the other amarian defenders and kind of they've been going along that route where jameel is kind of calling upon the players to um to help the amar Yes, she's been trying to gather up Capsuleer uh, loyalists, or Amorian loyalists to her cause, as well as other Capsuleers to uh, fight off the Drifter invasion. And of, mm-hmm. of course, uh, Pi and CBA are at the forefront of that because we have had 12 years of fighting for Amar, so our names obviously come first. But this is really the time for anyone to make a name for themselves in these events. Like, like, like if you're interested in, in lore or Amar, now's the time to get in. Right, and it's worth noting that um, uh, Affinity and Falcon came on our podcast um, a few months before all this started, and, and they did hint that it's going to be um, a hard time for the Amar. So that they, they've definitely become kind of a principal actor in the forefront of, of what's going on. They've been actively targeted by the drifters um, as a primary uh, operation. So, but let's, let's touch a little bit on, on that ship. Um, so the, how do you pronounce it again? The Octoritas. The Octoritas. And then, so that name, I'm guessing, is significant, right? Yes, it basically means authority. Well, that's a good name. So, um... It's interesting, and, and maybe somebody can answer this. Uh, what is the role of the flagship to the Golden Armada, or to the to the Amarian Armada? What what would the flag? What does it mean to be a flagship? 
The flagship basically is, in the traditional naval parlance, a flagship is the ship that carries a flag, namely the the strategic flags, the tactical flags, which is in old times it was the admiral's ship who had a guy, a flag, a flag waver, who would wave flags, signaling the rest of the fleet to conduct, you know, various maneuvers. So the flagship of a fleet is basically the main, uh, it is basically the command ship of the fleet. Cool. So it, in these events, Jamil has shown up in in a Titan, right? Yes. So wouldn't that be a downgrade? I mean, like, wouldn't whatever, wouldn't the Titan that she's currently in be, is, is the Titan that she's currently in the flagship? Do they have a flagship? Like, what is the, what is the significance of this Abaddon being declared a new flagship? The thing to keep in mind is that you don't always bring the biggest ship, the biggest ship to a fight. Like, a Titan is often going to be a strategic asset. It's going to be the thing that gets left behind, sometimes is brought in to, you know, do a little bit of uh, support of the battlefield. But it's not typically there. It's typically left behind to bridge and so on. But um, a battleship is typically considered, you know, it is the ship that is going to be at the front of the line. It's going to be the one that's right there fighting. And there's also the significance of it being the same type of ship that she used to fight off the, uh, the Elder Fleet. So it has some significance there from a symbolic perspective. Right. It also, I mean, that it cannot be ignored that that was the site that she was honoring, what is it, just a week after the keelating ceremony. So... Um, yes, yes. It, it, it is a less than subtle point in saying, you know, Jamil seems to be kind of reminding everybody, hey, remember what I did? I was a badass. You should follow me because, you know, we're doing badass things. Uh-huh. I think that's also noticed in the naming itself, the Octorios. It means authority. It's, the name specifically seems that it was chosen to remind people that she is the Empress of Amar. And that she is there to lead Amar, in spite of you know claims by Max Singularity or the scope that she's you know not there or insane or whatever. She's basically coming in and saying, "I'm still the leader. I'm still here. You still owe me your allegiance." Very cool. So um, now this is a new type of ship, right? So it is an Imperial issue Abaddon. Now, do you? Do we have any suspicion or does anybody want to go on a limb and, and try to make a prediction about whether or not this is going to be eventually a new type of ship that we have access to? Uh, apparently, Makoto has, has an opinion on that. So what, what, what you got? So notably, the previous Imperial issue ships were used as rewards for the succession uh, trials. And so we might end up seeing this ship uh, appear as a reward for some sort of notable event or service to the MR, either in new succession trials, if something untoward were to happen with Jamil Sorum, or if, um, for instance, someone is clearly at the forefront of uh, repelling drifter incursions. Okay, so you think that this might be some big, it could potentially be a reward for something as opposed to a something that goes out to everybody. If it's Imperial issue, then it's probably not going to be terribly common. Uh, otherwise, it would probably be a Navy issue. Uriel, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, about the uh, ship itself. Um, the dev blog talks about an Abaddon Imperial issue, of course, but uh, it's also confirmed in a thread by CCP Falcon that this thing won't be like the start of like some new class of ships for players. It will be something special, and it's supposed to have some sort of... Uh, more power grid or something, more capacitor, that sort of thing. It's said in the uh, news announcement about it, but it's not supposed to lead the way for any new class of ships, which is kind of sad because that would be nice, but it's going to be something special. So probably exactly what Mac was saying, an Imperial issue ship. For whatever reason, it'll be awarded or given to a player or even not. That's what it is. I mean, it, it, they're coy enough. It could literally just be a special ship that only Jamil uses as, or, you know, only is used for live events for specific things. Uh, but, uh, Samaria, you had uh, something to add? Samira? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, 
with the uh, the flagship, I doubt it will be handed to a player because it has been called a flagship. It has not been called like a. It is not like the the Righteous Cross, which is a ship that came out in honor of Capsuleer victory. This is the new flagship of the Imperial Navy, which means it's probably going to be a ship that Jamal herself or possibly Grand Admiral uh, Kes de Sundara is going to be flying. It'll probably be used maybe in the, the upcoming Drifter incursions, possibly as some kind of thing you have to defend, or, uh, or it'll be used for live events, but I doubt players will get it. Players might be able to get an Imperial issue skin, though, to color their own Abaddons. Right. Okay, so that's really important. So it's it's basically, uh, it's worth noting that the likelihood of this being something that anybody can get uh, is very low. Uh, if this does exist for players, it's going to be one of those multi-billion-isk kind of items, or, you know, it's going to be special. So uh, put that aside. So um, before we move on, I do want to point out, Uriel just did some talking Um uh, I, I want to give Uriel, in particular, before we move on, a, a huge shout out. He actually is at Eve, New England, right now. Um, you know, but but this is so important to him that he's kind of jacked in at the last second um, to be able to contribute to this p- panel. So thank you very much for coming. And and uh, how is Eve, New, New England, doing, by the way? Uh, it is extremely fun. I'm having a great time up here. Yesterday I got here a little late, but I got here before one of the uh, PvP tournaments. It's not PvP, it was a uh, inflatable gladiator ring. <laughs> and that's what we've been using. And we had a second tournament today. I've won some prizes, everyone's won prizes. We had a trivia contest and my team had a nice time with that. Uh, it's just been a lot of fun and we have a lot more to do later on. So this has just been really great. And I, t- I would love it if more of you come next year. Like, so wait, you're you're saying you're saying that this is a deployable uh, PvP arena? No, it is a gladiator ring inflatable IRL that we have out on a field. I think that qualifies as a deployable PvP arena. Yeah, right, it's, it's a dojo. So. I think you're right. Dojo confirmed. You heard it here first. All right. Well, thank you very much again. Um, all right. So moving right along, um, the, the the keel was laid in Safazon, which is relevant, will be relevant in a little bit. Um, and then uh, so that first event went pretty much uneventful, right? Like she kind of showed up, everybody gave compliments, she left, and that was basically the end of it, right? Samira? Um, notably, first off, is that Safazon is the headquarters of the Amar Navy. It is, you know, is where the, the Navy itself is commanded from. It's also the location of the Royal Shipyards, which is obviously why the flagship is being built there. Um, at the event, uh, aside from just naming the ship and showing that she, that Jamal is still present, she did take the time to, you know, denounce Max Singularity's uh, inquisition against her which was another important element of that event. That's true. But I would say that her, yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. So her, the first event was very much about her kind of interacting with the players, right? So the, she complimented Pi, she called out Max Singularity. She kind of did her, she, she kind of chatted with you guys for a little bit for lack of better words and then left, but there wasn't like any major like plot developments or anything like that. The second uh, one, oh, sorry, uh, uh, wow, I've got a lot of X's. So let's go with uh, Ascentior. You've got something? Uh, I think that one of the important things from uh, Amar, from Jamil's appearance there uh, was to point out that she is around, she is in the, uh, in the spotlight again. Um, she did specifically mention that um, her authority has been absolute during the time that people think that she hasn't been around. Um, so I think it was just kind of pointing out, hey, don't count me out, guys. I'm still around, I'm still here, and I'm still strong. Very cool. And um, sorry, Uriel X'd up earlier, but I thought that he it had already been addressed. So Uriel, you got something else to say? Uh, uh, yeah. So one of the questions, I mean, she like answered questions from players. One of them, uh, I asked, but um, it doesn't matter who asked. Uh, she said that the drifter threat was contained, which is an interesting thing to hear, especially given that they've been invading Amar space. That's just something uh, I just wanted to touch on there. 
that's that's a really good point. That's probably one of the most important things that she said during that first event. She actually said that the drifter threat was contained, which a lot of people kind of raised their eyebrows out at. But it was a, it was a very it was a clearly a very political statement, especially since the events that occurred like just a couple days later. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, all right. So and then Ravis, you have some more information about uh, the history of this whole of the of this whole situation. So it's actually relative specifically to the Abaddon. Um, and for those those people who may be listening, uh, you know, who don't have quite as, as much of a background, the original incident at uh, at over uh, over uh, Sarum Prime was uh, she was actually in an Abaddon at that time when she set off the super weapon that blew up the the Minmatar Armada, and that Abaddon ended up ended up uh, being part of what what later in Apocrypha would open up the wormholes. Uh, when it was blown up. So that one was lost. So there was actually a lot of speculation right around FanFest with the Righteous Cross that she was trying to resurrect that whole that whole ship. And, and it was something that uh, Falcon, I think, and Affinity mentioned that they were putting in sort of as a throwaway uh, announcement in one of the, in one of the uh, uh, scope videos. And when we actually got there, nothing really happened with FanFest, nothing really happened that came out of it, but they were surprised at the amount of attention that that sort of throwaway line got. So it's entirely possible that this new Abaddon is in reaction to the the community reaction that uh, that happened right prior to FanFest. And can you explain real quick what that reaction was? Well, I think there were a lot of people who were suggesting that there were other that there were other more sinister things that might be happening with the Righteous Cross. One, because why would they announce it if there was no point to it? But what they later confirmed was. There really wasn't. They just put it up there as a as a as sort of a throwaway event, and were surprised that people commented on it. That people were speculating specifically on that thing that they didn't think was going to get any reaction at all. And then finally, um, just in case if somebody doesn't know what the Righteous Cross was, uh, what what brought that about? What was it? Uh, I'll I'll defer to one of the PIE folks on that one. Well, actually, uh, Morwen already put up um, his yeah yeah. Uh... The ship was actually named after the medal that was given to every member of the Amar Militia when they completely took over their war zone the, with the Vimitar Republic. Um, it was because CCP gives out a medal to the militias whenever they do that. Um, well, so, hold on, hold it, on. It, it, they, they, they have in the past, but every single time they do, they say this is not necessarily going to happen every time or whatever. So, Well, it, it's not the first that... time. It happened right. the first time, I guess. So the Kaldari got one, the Galente got one, the Amar have one, the Midmatar have yet to take over the war zone, so they haven't gotten one yet. But the name of the medal was the Righteous Cross, and so the flagship was named after the medal in honor of the, the militia efforts. Okay. So then the Righteous Cross is the current flagship? Um, I'm, I'm actually going to let Samira answer this. Yeah. It's not a flagship so much as it is a. Uh, it's basically just a ceremonial ship. It's it's there to honor the medal. Notably, however, about the Righteous Cross is that it was given the uh, the prefix T E S, which is a prefix that uh, I believe Pi started in uh, in a uh, Rather, Pi started it a few years ago, uh, many years ago, to use T E S before their ships, which means the Empress's ship. Um, and after Pi started doing it, a lot of other Amar militia people started to also uh, use those that same prefix. And the fact that with the Righteous Cross, they also use that prefix is a pretty significant uh, inclusion. Because it's not, just the, it's not just honoring the Righteous Cross medal itself, it's also honoring the player's basically the way that the players name their ships in honor of, you know, honor of the Empress. Right. So um, in uh, the blog post that was posted in, on, um, looks like, July 18th, the Navy announces an Imperial keel laying ceremony, Empress confirmed to intend, which is the blog post that led to this event. Uh, it does specify that the Abaddon Imperial issue that is being laid down is... Um, the finalized version of the prototype version, the Righteous Cross. So there, there's that. Okay, so that was the first event. Um, did I miss any uh, X's? 
Let's see. Does anybody still need anything to say about this topic? Uh, I have something to say about the Jamil events uh, or something that didn't happen at them. Uh, I know we're yet to talk about the second one, but I think it's worth mentioning now that at neither event did drifters appear, even though they've appeared at all these other Amar events so far. That's true. There was no drifter presence at either of the events. Um, but in that, uh, go ahead, Samira. I was going to say, notably, not only have they not appeared at these events, but after the first engagement with their armada at Storm Prime by uh, CBA and other uh, capsuleers, they actually stopped roaming around Amar. I mean, it, before that, it had been known that they had been seen around everywhere around Amar. You, you could barely go two systems without running into a drifter battle fleet. After that event, a few days after, they just stopped appearing. You know, they've only been appearing at the observatories and so on. So when she said it was contained, you, you could really see that, yeah, it, it could be considered contained at that moment. And it explains why there was no attack on her during the events. So yeah, it was a. So her statement that the drifter threat at the, it was contained at that time wasn't wildly out of. Um, I don't know, out of reality, right? Yeah, yeah. Like at the time, you could be like, "Oh well, maybe maybe they are being beaten back," and then and then something happened. So let's go let's go on to the uh, the second event. Actually, let's skip to the second. Uh, um, Jamil event, which would be um, the Sorum Prime event, correct? Yes. Yes. So who wants to break down the uh, that second event? Uh, I can if you'd like. Sure, go for it. All right. So the Sorum Prime event, uh, the second one, was announced very shortly before it happened. Uh, very subtly also a uh, in a ticker on the scope video saying Jamil Sorum would be visiting the Mechios graveyard that weekend. And uh, when she did, it was the 25th of July, she appeared again at Mechios in Sorum Prime, where the uh, super weapon was used in her Titan, along with her uh, uh, escorts, and spoke for a while about, she kind of made a little dedication, a large, a very Soramite speech, uh, very good, it was a very good place to be for that, and uh, what happened afterwards was the interesting part, because when she finished her speech, uh, suddenly, there was a Gnosis on fields, and it started using the Entosis link on Jamil's ship. But it's worth mentioning that this was not the normal Entosis link we use. It used the same effect as the Drifters and Seekers ones. And it's also worth mentioning we can't use the Entosis link on any ships. This we, was. Hold on. Are we sure that it was an Entosis link? Because the Entosis link is a reverse engineering of Drifter technology, right? So. So what they're actually using may not necessarily be the same exact as we consider the entosis. It could be some sort of deeper scan or anything else. Uh, that, so I, so I, if I can get back to that. Uh, fitted to Machiraisha's ship was an entosis link too, which was definitely related, but they might have said something different to do with that. Also, uh, CCP Rise says hi. Um, and uh, I'm going to go back on about this now. Uh, after he was using it on the ship, um, oh, first of all, I need to mention that it is a society of conscious thought, which is obviously uh, something with a lot of links to the Jove, the Jove Directorate specifically. And Masiraish was trying to get information from Jamil's ship or Jamil herself. We don't really know, but I'll get to that in a second because uh, after he was doing that, they were telling him to stop. They told him to move to a safe distance. And he ended up saying that he had learned what he needed to learn. Right after that, the Amar Navy uh, operatives told the, everyone to kill him. And they obviously did. So not only did they blow him up, they blew him up after he was done using whatever they considered hostile. Now, from this though, and the fact that he was using the Entosis, and the fact that this was Jamil, and that's the SOCT, it's not unreasonable to assume that they know about the other in some capacity by this pat by this time okay so let's start unpacking that because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on here so uh, uh let's start with general stargazer he has something he wants to throw out about about this event so go for it general 
No, all I was going to add was um, we actually managed to see the, the kill mail when the, the ship was destroyed, and it did actually show the uh, Intosis link equipped on the ship, so we can pretty much say that it was on board. That's very good. Thank you for, for noting that. It, it is worth noting that they were using the Intosis link in a way that we as players cannot. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've actually given the, a picture of the, the kill mail to Lock, so we might be able to show it for us all. I mean, neat. Um, I think he's in, uh, he should be in, um, uh, Tranquility, so if you post it, it, it could be possible that he could just show it, but I'm not sure. Um, so then next would be Makoto, you are clearly chomping at the bit to talk about the Entosis fact of things, or side yeah. of things. So the curious thing with the Entosis link, or rather the animation used by Monsi Race when he was scanning Jamil's uh, Sarum's Titan, is that the animation was identical to the Circadian Seekers animation. So presumably the SOCT having its show foundation uh, is better able to use the technology. And so it was using that same sort of scanning methodology that the Drifters and Seekers use. And it's worth noting, of course, that the Intosis link itself is derived from recovered Jove technology, and in developing the Tech 2 version, you use Sleeper encryption uh, as the skill to create it. Right. Okay, so I'm going to bounce over to Ravis for some of the history here, but I'm going to actually frame it with a question, which is, um, so the SOT, SOCT is uh, a fairly uh, significant organization um, within... Eve. However, they're not really talked about very much because we don't have missions to go kill them. They don't. They they just don't show up a lot. We've mentioned them a few times, but I don't know if we've really dove, dived into them. So, if you can, please explain. Like we know that the SOCT was originally Joven Foundation, but what are they now? What is what are they doing? What does it mean that SOCT is showing up? Well, there's there's a lot of speculation around that. The uh, the SOCT, as you mentioned, originally started as a a Jovian offshoot, and uh, where and and sort of developed Even into a SOCT set of of schools, up. if you will. Um, they had some controversy along the way where they had to change some of the the things that they were doing. There's a chronicle called the the uh, hyper consciousness agenda, which is part of the Black Mountain Chronicle uh, that goes into a little bit more depth about that. Um, but what it, what essentially it, it suggests is that their ties back to the original Jove, not the drifters, but the, the, the Jovian, uh, directorate, uh, gave, give them more information than the rest of us have, particularly around the Jovian, the Jovians as a society and as a, as a, a race. And so you can pretty much bet that they know more of what's going on than most of the rest of us do. Um, so I think when we talk about potentially they're aware of the other, I think that's a pretty good likelihood, uh, particularly if you look back at uh, the the famous quote from E.R. Lebron, who is uh, one of their one of their original members. I believe he was actually I believe he was the founder. If not, he was one of the one of the heads a bit later. Um, but he has a a quote that says, "Imagine if the bars to your prison were all that you had ever known. Then one day someone appears and unlocks the door. If they have the power to do this, then are they really the liberator?" You never remember who it was that closed you in. And that has been interpreted by a lot of people to be uh, a, a, a quote that's about the sleepers being moved away from the rest of Jovian society. So there's a strong possibility there that, that, that they know something that we don't. Um, in addition, when you look at the wording of, of Sarum's speech at the Mechios graveyard at this event, um, she is very, very forceful in this particular uh, discussion about bringing the fight, really about t about taking it that it to to that next level. And she's giving this at the Mechios graveyard, where if you read the Empyrean Age book, um, it is she's completely under control of the other at that event. Um, she actually doesn't remember it. She comes in, blacks out, wakes up to blown up ships and her own ship kind of falling apart around her. Um, and so the fact that she's doing this at that site with all the references to that event in this very strident manner um, sets off some alarm bells. And, uh, and when you look at, you know, her, kind of her take on like the reclaiming, which is the big push that the Amar were making to retake uh, the Minmatar and other area, uh, you know, other areas at, at one point prior to Emperor Hyderan. And the fact that she kind of ramped that down during her during her uh, her 
term and during her time in 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 the uh, as the empress, and then now all of a sudden she's back to strident uh, and and she was at her coronation and then dropped off and then came back as well. So there's there's definitely some ties pointing back to potential other driven events going on in this whole scenario. Okay, so uh, we may come back to that for a second, but Fai, you have an important question for the panel? Yeah, uh, Nathaniel20 in the stream is asking uh, if uh, he looked at the kill mail and saw that the Entosis link dropped, and he's wondering if any of you know if uh, if that was picked up by a player, or if the wreck was destroyed, or what. I'm fairly certain the wreck, the pod, and the corpse were all very quickly destroyed. Because uh, a lot of us were offering certain rewards for some things and no one ever came forward and it really looks like everything just got blown up that's most unfortunate all right so um okay so again there's still there, there's a lot of stuff going on here uh so jamil uh is kind of ramping up her her war footing again probably because well but this time mostly focusing on on the drifters this guy shows up scans her and she just orders the attack up. Well, the, the her commander, right? Her second in command is the one that orders weapons free. I think she authorizes him to open fire. That's right. And, and any supporting fleet, basically. Okay, so let's go back to the Society of Conscious Thought. Um, so the Society of Conscious Thought was mostly founded by Jove, correct? Um, but the Jove are p- possibly dead or are not in communication anymore. So do we think that the SOCT is working as puppets of the Jove, or do you think that they've used their information that they've gleaned from years with working with the Jove to kind of forward their own agenda? Do, do, are they puppets or are they puppet masters? Well, I, I would guess that this is a situation where if, if the, the director is truly gone, that they are operating with all of the information that they've had for years and have been gathering for years and are trying to figure out if what they're seeing is what they actually expected. Uh, call it, call it uh, knowing what the plan was behind the scenes, call it having additional information, call it having a good hunch. But uh, I think they can look at this and know a little more than the rest of us about what it might mean and how it might have affected the rest of the job and therefore be able to say, if these guys are here, then dot, dot, dot. Um, one, pot- one potential way you could look at it is if the drifters are here specifically to attack the other and they know that the drifters only show up in the cases of A, B, C, D, and E or only can return in situation one, two, or three, then they're probably trying to figure out what situation it was that brought them back. So here's a fun question. Um, so those, those listening logs from the, from the Jove Observatory stations, could it be possible that the SOCT are, were aware of those logs? Could it be possible that SOCT were related to those structures uh, prior to this going on? I would think that wouldn't be an unreasonable assumption. Yeah, I could see that being the case. All right, Uriel, uh, you have something to say about the SOCT. Yeah, just about how um, what we were saying about what they might know or what their goal is. Uh, regardless of it, they're not completely linked with the directorate, of course. They're a splinter group, even though they're very related. And, um, well, with that, if anything, I think they'd be trying to figure out what the situation is. And they obviously know something is up with Jamil Sorum. Uh, regardless of what the drifters actually are, uh, the other is something important to this entire arc, and I think that they're gonna, they're focusing a lot on that and finding out all they can about it. We're also putting a lot of focus on the SOCT confirming that she's in possession of the other, but I think it's also worth noting that it is very reasonable for the discovery that they're talking about to being the fact that she is a Capsuleer. Or she is a uh, Imperian, rather. She's a clone. Because that's also not public knowledge. That too, no, yes. no, that that's is right. that is public knowledge by common sense. Um, all of the all of the heirs at the last succession trials deliberately deactivated their um, their scanners when they potted themselves. They were in capsules and then self destructed. Uh, it looks um, like a centaur has something important to say. Uh, common sense does not count when it comes to the miracle of the Empress. Obviously, God brought her back for a reason. She's definitely not a clone. 
That's the Theology Council's line. However, it's not an unreasonable assumption to make from the player character's perspective. It, there's yeah. plenty of evidence that basically says it's a cover story from the Theology Council, but on the other hand, who really cares? Right, but, but you got to think about so I wouldn't say she, I wouldn't go outright saying, you know, people don't know that she's a capsuleer. It's more that people don't care. There's a but very big difference. My point is, is that it is very, it is a very clear line of logic that SOTC would show up to confirm whether or not she is not who she says she is. She's, you know, I think that that would be easier to detect than than the fact that she's also possessed by the Drifter, like, or the the other. Like, they don't. I think it's easier for them to come to the conclusion that she is a clone and want to verify that than than otherwise. But it looks like Samira also has something to say about this. So go for it. Well, the thing with her being a capsuleer, as Morlin said, that is already known. All of the heirs at the time were capsuleers. Um, her being a clone, it's not uh, its not necessarily completely out of the picture, for, even for Amar. Before she was found Empress, she was there was a lot of uh, public outcry about her return. There were several news posts about it. One guy got declared a heretic and got locked up in a monastery. Um, so a lot of there are plenty of people who do think that she is a clone. It's just not proper to you know accuse her of it. The thing is with the the uh, SOCT guy Mr. Reich, when he came there, he was talking about he is investigating an existential threat. Her being a clone is not really an existential threat. Her being a capsuleer is not that. For him to have specifically gone there, there to scan there, scanner, as an existential threat means they know something that is far worse than any of those. That is a very, that is an extremely profound point. Thank you, um, Makoto. Uh, Makoto, you have something about detecting the other. It's noteworthy that um, in. The Empyrean Age, we hear that she's been in a cloning facility for years, being rewritten, um, having her brain rewritten, uh, rewritten in strange and unknown ways, with her medical staff just sort of looking on in shock and incomprehension. So um, it's reasonable to assume that her neural structures are just abnormal beyond all description. And so if you were to actually scan her brain, that those structures would be detectable. We also we don't, don't know. know the exact uh, capabilities for the circadian seeker scan, so... And, uh, and if I can mention... Sure, and then we gotta bounce over to Mark. Right, and if I can just mention something, the stuff about the Intosis stuff, you know, direct mind-machine connection or mind-to-mind -mind connection goes back to everything we've already, we've already uh, seen in that and talked about anyhow, so that actually worked very well with that. Right. Okay, Mark. Uh, I just wanted to give a brief background for people who may not be aware of it. Uh, the reason we were talking a little bit back about why her being a capsuleer uh, might be a big reason, at least under Amar theology, is more the fact that uh, the Amar follow this doctrine called the Doctrine of Sacred Flesh. Uh, the uh, The heirs are supposed to end the eventual emperor slash empress are supposed to be pure of flesh they can't they can be modified of course but clones are considered to be impure so none of the heirs while they may have been capsuleers are really allowed to have been potted because at that point their flesh becomes impure they are no longer directly from god i believe and please correct me if i'm wrong on that and then uh they would no longer be really able to hold the throne. And so that's why people may have been making a big deal about whether or not she was a clone. Although I tend to agree that the SOCT has a uh, idea that the other is around and that they're trying to poke around on that. Very cool. I appreciate it. So I think that that should probably about close up those two live events. Um, does anybody have any uh, further notes about either of those specific events? And then we'll move on to the kind of the drifter incursion section. I'm not seeing any X's, so we'll move on. Uh, to the uh, note to the panel, I'm actually going to move the first bullet point kind of later on because I want to talk about the events leading up to the incursions, and then we'll talk about the incursions itself. So 
Um, on that note, uh, as, as she pointed out in her first address, she said that the drifter threat is contained so that we can all kind of go back and relax and stop worrying about it, right? All over, return to your homes. Yeah, everybody go home, nothing to see here. Samiria, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, Samiria, you have uh, information about um, that not being true. So why don't you tell us about the drifter raid in Safazon first? Uh as mentioned before, Safazon is the headquarters of the Amara Navy, um, so it's very important from a strategic perspective. It is also where basically all of this stuff has uh, has basically collided. The, uh, the Octoritas is being constructed at the Royal Shipyards in Safazon, and the data from Mentor Reish was sent to be analyzed at Safazon. So the drifters attacking that point, there's a lot of different reasons why they could be there. They could be there to knock out, you know, the headquarters, like Battlestar Galactica style, Cylons attack, or they could be there trying to get the data. They could be trying to take out the ship. Maybe there's something about the ship. We don't know why exactly they attacked there, but there's many reasons why they want to gone there. So, and uh, when they attacked, attack. there was, they brought about 150 ships, um, Amar defended with about 400 uh, Navy NPCs. It was the first uh, NPC versus NPC combat that EVE has had. Um, the uh, Amar Navy took down about 70 of the drifters and lost about 300 to 350 ships before they withdrew and then Capsuleers did the rest. Yeah, so there's some fairly significant things about this um about this event, the most notable of which um, is actually not really a lore-ish thing, but is more of a game mechanic thing. Um, we, we confirmed with CCP Affinity that day, um, this, that event marked the very first time in the history of EVE Online that a NPC shot at another NPC in the view of players. Like, I'm sure that they've done it before in tests and stuff like that, but this is the first time it's happened live on Tranquility with other player actors and everything like that. So prior to this event, it's been an understood rule that, that NPCs can't shoot at other NPCs, that, that in, you know, we've talked about this before. If, if there is combat, then they just make explosions and they kind of fake it. This is the first time that another uh, NPC, or an NPC presumably locked and shot at another NPC in the actual script of the event. Um, it's also worth noting that there were three different types of kind of M uh, uh, NPCs that were interacting in this event. Um, the first was the Drifters NPCs, which are, of course, the new AI. There was a new set of Amarian NPCs, which also appeared to be using a new AI. So the Amar Navy, they had their own forces that appeared to be working under new AI because they were firing back. They were behaving closer to kind of the drifter AI than to the standard Imperial AI, or, you know, rat AI more or less. And then finally, you know, there was some standard uh, AI actors or, you know, or NPC characters, like for instance, uh, because we had people that came in that had too low standings, the MR Navy was brought in just through the course of play. Right. So like customs and, and uh, defenders against, uh, players that were there that aren't supposed to be there and, you know, whatever. But it was worth noting that the drifters did in fact attack the, um, the, all of the NPCs, including, uh, well, all of the Amar Navy NPCs, right? Um, but the Amar Navy, only the new Amar and Navy attacked anybody else. The, the old ones that spawned through old mechanics still behaved like old, old NPCs. They didn't engage other NPCs or really, interact with them much. Is that is that a fair assessment? That's correct. I'm rolling in there in a, a Galente militia character. It created the, the old style uh, Navy NPCs, which the drifters attacked, but they didn't attack back. So yeah, that's pretty accurate. And Samir, do you have anything else to throw in there? Yes. The uh, AI for the Mar the Amar NPCs seems to be the exact same that is used on the drifters. They operated in basically the exact same function. They all fired at the same primary. They tended to get into a ring formation, just like the drifters. So it seems to be this, the same AI. 
even the ships are called roaming Amar cruiser, roaming Amar frigate, while the drifter ones are roaming sleeper battleship. So it's the same, probably the same AI with maybe some minor tweaks and just different components. Notably, also the Amar and Navy NPCs, the loot they dropped, they were actually using Imperial Navy crystals rather than, you know, other crystals. So they specifically were using the proper ammo that, you know, that they should be using. Very interesting. Okay, so Makoto, you have more background information about the AI being used? So, quick thing to note is that there is um, a presentation from this last FanFest on the deployment of the Blackboard AI, and the drifters are actually a primary test bed for the new AI so that they can iterate on it, see how players try to break it. And the plan, as we know, is for uh, CCP and Team Space Glitter to roll this AI out to all NPCs uh, in EVE by, I believe, year end is what they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said on Hydrostatic podcast when they came on that one of the goals for her team is to completely replace all AI um, on Tranquility with maybe not necessarily as, as violent and as you know hostile as Drifter, but you know with new AI that functions via a new way of kind of making decisions. Indeed. And it's worth noting, of course, that some of the behaviors that we've seen with the Drifters can be viewed as uh, testing various forms of AI. For instance, when the drifters were hanging out in a Mars space, scanning everything that comes through and blowing up ships with Intosis links on them, that's sort of a customs officer behavior. That's a very good point. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, once the, the fight proper was done at uh, Safazon, i.e. the Amar were basically routed, uh, the drifters did create very blockade-like formations of, of spheres around gates and stuff like that. And they also, they, they had multiple detachments that seemed to wander around as if they were attempting to do a real blockade. Yeah, and actually at that point, uh, players did take over the continued whittling down of the drifters, and it's notable that uh, a few different tactics were used. Uh, for instance, uh, Sinyal and a number of players attempted to use smart bombing battleships to pop the overshields in unison. And Pi then brought in uh, a large number of uh, cheap sacrificial destroyers so that they could just, you know, keep throwing bodies at the drifters. And uh, Pi was indeed the party that ended up finishing off the drifters in Safazon. Okay, and so how you noted earlier that uh, after the last uh, drifter attack, um, their patrols had been significantly less, to the, which led her to say that the drifter threat was contained. Um, and then this happened. Has there been any change in drifter behavior overall after this event? After this event specifically, no. However, um, it is noteworthy that the drifters appear to be more defensive of unidentified wormholes. They seem to hang out at them longer to defend them against interlopers. And uh, mechanically, uh, they do now scram, web, and newt, which they weren't doing prior to uh, the Aegis release. Which so, was confirmed to be a bug, uh, just like with the sleepers, because the sleepers originally didn't properly newt either a long time ago, and that was fixed. Um, so CCP has basically disguised cases of, oops, this wasn't working properly as emergent behavior within the game universe. So, so. Yeah. Though it is worth noting very specifically that the scram on drifters is a 500 kilometer five point scram. So just so you know, just to warn you. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, was there anything else that, that really that needs to be talked about about that particular event? There wasn't really um, a lot of like talked about acting or anything like that. It was just kind of like the Amar got smashed and Capsuleers had to slowly get rid of the incursion. That, that pretty much sums it up, right? Did we cover exactly why the event happened, you know, aside from the in-character stuff? Well, we, we, we did discuss the importance of the system, but do you have any... Do you have well, any, it was uh, more that... It was literally that Affinity basically took a Friday afternoon to test some new AI, and she just dropped them into a system on TQ instead of doing it on a, a test server. And then when she went home for a long weekend, she ba when somebody asked, are you going to get rid of the drifters? She said, no, that's your problem. <laughs> that's right. I do remember that. She's like, it's <laughs> not my job to move them. That's your job. 
points to CCP Affinity for that. Yes. All right. So, um, so then, Makoto, you all, uh, Makoto, you also wanted to talk about uh, what's been going on with the Jove Observatories. Now, these are the Jove Observatories that uh, have decloaked. Uh, you know, they're, they're the ones that we've been watching. You can intosis them and get um, information out of them. They're, but the you know they attract the attention of the drifters. But uh, something has been changing. So, what's going on? So this is uh, going to be a very quick update. So from the original deployment of the Jove Observatories, uh, we knew that there were six different stages of destruction that say how badly broken up they were and how badly they were fragmented. Uh, notably, with the Aegis release, the Jove Observatories went to the second of six stages. So if you look at it, there's uh, active holing of the structure on the bottom quarter. There's uh, more gaseous discharge, energetic discharge, that type of thing. So they are slowly being harvested to the point of destruction. How quickly they will be destroyed and when they'll end up actually being removed, or whether they will be, is a good question. Okay, so are we still in destruction stage two then? Correct, we are for now. Okay. Well, that's good, because I remember when I was hunting around for... Because they, they, they went into stage two at about the same time that the wormholes became traversable. No, actually, that happened uh, during the Aegis release. Okay, so was that before then? So um, they started uh, hitting destruction, I believe, when the unidentified wormholes went uh, traversable. And then going to the second stage, wait, no, 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 pardon, correction, that was wrong. Um, they were destroyed upon the appearance of the unidentified wormholes. And they went to stage two with the Aegis release, which is notably after the wormholes were traversable. Okay, okay, thank you. Um... All right. So, is there anything else that we have to say about the um, uh, the Job Observatories? Well, let me let me just ask the panel real quick. Um, so, uh, I know that there's been a lot of effort uh, to figure out the Intosis links, and the best thing that Intosis gets to work on, besides our sovereignty structures, is these Job Observatories. Um, has there been any change to the to the information that we can glean from them, or is there any updates on Intosis links on um, uh, structures? that are not sovereignty in general. Uh, is there any update on that? I know you guys have been working hard on that. Uh, we haven't found any changes, really. Uh, admittedly, after the initial testing, it has slowed down a bit because it seems unlikely that uh, CCP will add a new Intosis link trigger without something showing up in the database. Yeah, that, we haven't seen anything new on the Singularity database that suggested that such a thing would be worth checking. I mean, we can take the time to test it on ships and stuff, but I don't think we're going to get anything new out of the observatories in particular. It, it's always it's, worth testing other structures, but I don't think we're going to get anything new out of the, the observatories themselves. So that, I do. That, that said, uh, the there are still some things we haven't really deciphered exactly what the events are. Uh, I started a, an exp a spreadsheet quite some time ago now uh, where people can kind of contribute different things to the the analysis of uh, the things that we have gleaned from those towers. I'll link that in the Twitch chat. Um, but certainly anyone, public, it's open publicly, anyone's welcome to come in and put in some input if they have some ideas of, as to what we haven't figured out yet there. Okay, so we're rounding out the first hour, um, which means that we're about halfway through with this panel. Um, and again, I thank uh, all of you for making time this Saturday. And of course, uh, to our audience, uh, thank you for continuing to contribute and asking questions. We will try to get to some questions and whatnot. And as always, if we do not get to the questions, we'll kind of collate them and, and send them to the panel and get them uh, marked down. So feel free to ask questions in Twitch. Um, but I think we're going to actually move on to, to the, I guess, you know, now that we're an hour in, we might as well talk about the whole reason or what the, what the thing's named after, which is the drifter incursions. So um, I'm going to throw it over to you, Morwin, uh, to kind of uh, introduce us to this concept. To what, the new incursion? Yes. Well, well uh, basically, a couple weeks ago, we uh, noticed on Singularity that there was a new entry in the, in the incursion journal uh, tab for the site list called uh, Defense of the Throne Worlds. 
And I don't know if somebody provided pictures to Locke for those for him to bring up, because they're only on Singularity. But um, there are now uh, six new sites that are listed for much smaller groups. I think the largest one was up to 20, and the smallest was supposed to be like three to five players. That basically you have two different types of sites. You have defensive and offensive sites. Um, The defensive sites are basically a group of players defending Amarian NPCs that um, presumably will be using the new AI that uh, Affinity was testing, um, and you defend them uh, from drifters. And then there are the offensive sites where you're going into what they're calling drifter influxes. So I'm assuming those are probably going to be sites that are either, they're probably designed similarly to the unidentified wormhole sites um, or something from one of those unidentified wormholes themselves where you're taking the fight to the drifters. We don't know where any um, of those are going to be taking place. Like, but there was some discussion before we started the stream whether you know the defensive sites would only be in high sec and the offensive ones might be in the unidentified wormholes themselves. Um, so far, we haven't actually seen any of these sites or incursions show up on Singularity. They um, we do check periodically just to take a quick look at them. Um, the other thing is they pay out ISK, and instead of Concord LP, they pay out what they just is just referred to as Amar LP. For we we don't know where that LP goes, whether it's like some new corporation um, that will be specific to this, or if it's just going to be kind of generic that you can apply to any corporation in. Uh, under the MR banner, uh, I would personally assume that they're probably going to create a new one that is unique to this, because otherwise it would really, really devalue um, all existing MR LP. Um, but we'll have more information on that as time goes on. We don't know exactly when it's going to be released, because there's just so little um, available on Singularity for them. So. Cool. So um, we want to touch base. And we want to touch on a couple of those points. Um, you, you did point out that there is two different types of sites, and and I just want to point out because this is something I've heard a lot about these incursions ever since that they're released. Because the problem is, is that like you know when something like this is data mined and it's posted on Reddit or you know whatever, um, people see it that don't listen to like these lore panels or anything else, um, and therefore don't have any context. And so a lot of the big fe- fear that's coming out is that this is just going to be like a buff to high sec and that they're all going to be in high sec because it's the throne wor- worlds, which is a high sec area. But um, I would caution people to not make assumptions as to what the mechanics are going to be until we actually have them laid out. Um, you know, obviously yes, the, the, I personally feel, and this is, this is me, Asherathi. I don't know anything. I'm not actually, you know, J. R. George R. R. Martin of lore. Uh, I, I just want to caution everybody because I, I personally believe that um, the drifter side of the incursions will be the quote unquote null sec being in wormhole space in the drifter wormholes or whatever, because that's when you take the fight to them. Um, and then um, meanwhile, the, uh, the high sec incursions would be the defense of the throne worlds, which kind of makes sense because the defenders, you're going to be working with the MR. So you probably need smaller numbers. There might be a smaller payout or whatever. But then if you go into the drifter ones, those may be the harder ones. Too. No, actually, that, that's what I was saying. But there's, um, there's six different sites and there's three sizes for each group, whether it's defensive or, or offensive. Um, and this, actually, I pulled up. I, I pulled them up just to kind of go, hold on. And while you're doing that, I'll shoot it over to Uriel because he's got a point. Yeah, and he's yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just going to talk about that specifically. Uh, the different sites, there are three for... Uh, there's three Amar Navy sites, there's three Drifter sites. There's the Amar Defensive Outpost, Amar Encampment, and the Battalion one. The de- the smallest site is the Defensive Outpost, and it, you know how they always want an optimal number of people for uh, incursions and things? It wants five to eight pilots, and the Encampment wants nine to 16, and the Battalion, which is the highest level one, wants 14 to 25 pilots. So they're smaller numbers than the uh, current incursions. And then you get to the drifter ones, which are the moderate, severe, and critical influx sites where you will be attacking the drifters. Now, I'd also like to say, um, as for this being what people have been worried about being a buff to high sec, 
this is the defense of the throne worlds and i really feel like this is going to be more of a non-permanent story arc type of incursion type thing but i feel like this is going to move possibly into a new expanded type of that now remember how the drifters use you know what looks like entosis and things i mean with the new severity system who's to say they won't end up becoming a uh, the drifter incursions being a uh, force that people will have to be careful against in Nullsec when they hold Sov, because obviously NPCs don't blue anyone. And yeah, yeah, and, and, uh, yeah. Links. yeah, and worth noting is that the, 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 the size numbers that uh, Uriel gave for the, um, the MR Navy ones, those same sizes apply to uh, the Drifter ones, moderate, uh, severe, and critical, uh, respectively. Yep. Also, uh, I mean, I want to point out that uh, I'm well, M Makoto pointed out in our chat, and I want to kind of emphasize this, um, that we don't know what the ships that we're going to be encountering there or what ships that it's going to be designed for, right? Like, we don't know if it's going to be, like, frigate-level fighting or battleship-level fighting or whatever. Like, we just know the number of people, um, the numbers of people that are going to be in each site. So just because the same number are for the drifters than, on, than the MR doesn't necessarily mean it's not harder. But it looks like Uriel is going to counterpoint me, so go for it. Uh, it's not so much of a counterpoint, so much as um, we don't really know what's going to go on, but at least in the Amar Navy sites, where they're defending against the Drifters already, it's not unreasonable to think that they might be fight that they're, well, they are going to be fighting the Drifters too. And considering, uh, you know, the Overshield and Super Weapon, they may end up taking the brunt of that, leading to fights with a lot more Drifters, but a lot less Doomsdaying on players by all possibilities. And also, um, Considering they're all NPCs, who's to say you couldn't help the Drifters if you wanted to by killing Amar Navy NPCs? Oh, that's that's a frightening thought. All we need is Capsuleers aligning with the with the Drifters. How, how do you know that we aren't really there? Haven't been their patsies all along? Oh, I'm I'm that would not even surprise me a little bit. All right, so uh, does anybody else have anything to say about the Drifter incursions? Indeed. Shoot. So one thing to note is that we're thinking of this in terms of uh, our opponent always being Drifter battleships, and it's entirely possible that we'll be fighting a lot of sleeper drones, Circadian Seekers, other such ships. As we have seen in the Drifter hives, that the Drifters have suborned or are producing sleeper drones for their own use. Right, and we're going to be getting to the Drifter Hives in a few minutes. Um, so we'll touch on that sort of stuff when we get there. Oh, and also... Actually, pass this off to Fi. Yeah, we've just, uh, we've just had confirmation from uh, CCP Paradox on Twitter that uh, most of the questions about Drifter Incursions will probably be answered this week on Singularity. So uh, if, you're, if you don't have that Singularity client installed, now would be an excellent time to start downloading. All right, well, in that case, since we know that uh, this is going to be obsolete within the week, we're going to stop doing tinfoil theories about uh, the Drifter's incursions and just kind of move on to the next topic, because that will be answered uh, before the week's out. Sweet. Thank you so much, uh, CCP, for confirming that for us. Well, that works. All right, so moving on. Uh, Can we just jump in before we move on? Yeah, what, what's up? Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to point out that uh, we've also created an in-game channel for coordination of people that want to get involved in Defense of the Throne World, and that is aptly named Defense of the Throne World. It's an in-character channel, um, but people are welcome to join in and find out more about it to get involved. When you say in-character channel, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, the intent is for people to be able to, to uh, speak as their in-game character. So, for example, I'll be a bit of Marian, printing like I'm in charge of everyone. Um, and we try and keep the uh, the game world as the real world rather than linking posts about caps and things. So, yeah, so I encourage people to go check that out. Um, but re be, please be respectful of the community that you're joining. Though I think now Makoto needs a cat in-game so that I can link cat pictures. <laughs> can, I, <laughs> can I link Fido pictures? Oh, of if course. only there were more Fidos. Uh, uh, well, you could always link videos of uh, Max Singularity petting his. There you go. All right, so moving right along. Um, actually, I'm going to hop past uh, the next topic to the topic after, um, and then we'll go back to the other one later. So we'll jump straight into Drifter Hives because that keeps on coming up. So 
Uh, Uriel, uh, why don't you lay the foundation for our discussion about Drifter Hives? Because I don't think... When we last did a lore panel, I don't think the Drifter Hives were even seen, right? They were on um, Singularity, so... That's right. Okay, so why, So Drifter Hives uh, have come to Tranquility, and some pretty cool stuff has happened. So why don't you uh, let us know, Yuri? All right. So uh, like he just said, the Drifter Hives have been on Tranquility for a while now, and uh, a number of groups have taken shots at them. Uh, the group, me and Makoto and a number of other people from here were involved in, uh, were the first ones to totally map out, thanks to um, thanks to a certain map maker, very Zindi grade, very uh, useful of him, very nice of him to do that. Uh, we finished each of the hive sites, and we got a number of the drifter elements, which are something that only comes from the center vault of the hive, which is also extremely difficult to get to in the first place. But beyond that, you have to do two hives to get one element, because the guard at the hives is called the Hikanta Tyrannos. It's a drifter that also by now has had its DPS changed to double that of a normal drifter battleship. And uh, it will drop something called an index. This index is labeled with one of the hive names and it'll always drop the one in the next hi- uh, the next uh, part of the sequence. So the sequen go- sequence goes um, from hive to hive. Each Ikanto will drop an index that unlocks the vault in the next hive and you'll be able to get one of these strange elements from there. We don't have any use for them yet, but it's pretty uh, obvious that they're going to play some large role in the future. Uh, so, we've, so we've mapped sorry, out them. Um, let me, let me uh, interject. Uh, Lockfox has uh, nicely put up the maps to the Twitch channel, so you can actually see the maps that have been created for these various drifter hives. And if you want to run them, take a shot. They're very hard. You're going to need a lot of help, but go for it. There are a few people who have done it, and a few people have gotten quite a bit. So we're looking to see who does what. Now, I know that somebody, I don't remember who, and I probably don't want to mention it, uh, but there is somebody, at least one person in EVE right now, that has a complete collection of all of the elements, correct? Multiple people. Uh, yeah, a number, a number of, people of people have collections, but some people have a lot more than others, also not naming names. We also, uh, it's worth noting, we have no idea what these elements are used for. We're just collecting them at this point, so it's anyone's guess. All right, General Stargazer, I'm sure you have something to say about these guys. <laughs> I was just going to say, if uh, if you are interested in actually giving the, 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 the actual complexes a go, uh, I've written a uh, few posts up on Crossing Zebras, uh, parts one, two, and three of an article, uh, just covering essentially what you need to know in terms of what's inside and how you go about doing it. Um, I also put a little video on the end just giving a a final run through of the last few rooms just to help people try and get through it. I really like to to see more people trying to get through them. Um, I know there's not really much incentive beyond the mystery of actually running them at the moment, but they are certainly worth doing. Right. Okay. And um, let's see. Uh, Makoto, did you have anything you wanted to contribute? Yeah, a couple of things on methods. So there have been two, well, uh, three methods to get to the hive used so far. Uh, one, of course, is you know grabbing uh, a fast cloaky ship and uh, slow boating to the hive, which is about uh, twenty thousand kilometers from the entry room or let's say the, the lobby or split, depending on the name you give to it. Um, and the other two methods, the primary methods for getting a fleet in, uh, either there is the Horde method, which was used by Exploration Frontiers, Inc., uh, which uses caracals and ospreys, and you just send uh, a bunch of uh, brave newbies down each side, and you just sort of ignore the drifters in the interim, and does take a fair number of pilots. I believe they were doing it with 70. Uh, the other method used by the expeditionary group uh, used about 14 to 18 pilots in various cloaky ships, including some disposable meat shields in a prototype or improved cloaks. Uh, and again, we generally had most success with caracals and ospreys because caracals basically treat drifters like slow, oversized frigates. I also, on a personal note, want to recommend that anybody who wants to try these sites do not take shame in learning how they work before you go in, because 
they're very hard to get to. They're very dangerous. And if you go into it without knowing how they work, I almost guarantee you that you will mess it up the first time and will permanently lock yourself out from them. Actually, the cans now reset immediately. So you won't oh, permanently oh, lock yeah. yourself out. You'll just take losses. And our first run took something like 14 hours, which was madness. That is kind of madness. Well, yes, but it sort of paid off. And the you final run still took 10 hours. <clears throat> Well, that was because Mark isn't the luckiest <laughs> bastard around. <laughs> Rude. All right. So, um, does anybody have anything else to say about the hives themselves? I, it is so, worth noting that I know we noted this before, but the hive, the physical structure of the main thing in the middle, does match the appearance of the uh, of the big structure behind. Uh, in, in the sleeper section of the Emergent Threats trailer. So we have identified this as, in fact, not only the Emergent Threats, the threats trailer uh, structure, but also the structure from um, Highland 2 Costa's final broadcast, which is now being shown. Also, also just a uh, note, it is gorgeous out there. And one note about the hives themselves, their structure, uh, they not only have a blue effect on the inner circle area that is identical to the one on the Sisters of Eve ships and around the, the spike. Stargate. Yep, and the Galente Stargate, indeed. Uh, but the Sisters of Eve one may be a more significant link considering they built their ships in Thera and look what's going on in wormhole space. Uh, also, along the spikes that are sticking off the bottom of it, they have the same effect as the Drifter propulsion systems. We have nothing to show what they may or may not do yet, but they may be gates or they may even be mobile, which would be a frightening idea, but possible nevertheless. Right. Given the fact that there are smashed structures around the rings, in particular, it looks like the ring smashed into it. The idea that these things could potentially be mobile is not unreasonable. Alternatively, it could simply be that this is the first harvesting point for sleeper bodies and they've cut open the enclaves. Uh, some things that are covered probably in the past lore panel but should be recanted, um, or recounted, I suppose. Uh, these are the only destroyed enclaves we've seen, the ones that are actually cut open. And there are Jove bodies and uh, cryostasis capsules in the hive rooms, as if they've we're taking these towards the hive and just sort of dropped them because something else more important came along. And additionally, uh, which we'll play into something later, uh, we did find healing Tukos's body in the readout hive. Uh, though interestingly, when we came back uh, a week later, it was no longer there. We're right, gonna pretend, gonna... pretend we had a moment of silence for Highland Tukos. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that actually, um, that we might as well just jump right into that piece then. Um, so uh, one of the people who are not on our panel today, regrettably, is Lucas, uh, who uh, it'd be really great to, to hear from him. But some of you guys were also involved in that same uh, shakedown, we'll call it. Yeah, it just so happens. So, so why don't you talk about what happened from your perspective? I'm pretty sure most people that's been paying attention to what's going on heard Concord's side of the story, but why don't you tell your side of the, the story? So I'll try to give the uh, the story in a, a quick form, just because, you know, there's other stuff to talk about. Um, so basically, on patch day, uh, a group of us were running the first hive we came across, essentially, which was the readout hive. Uh, it took ridiculously long. And once we got into the hive room, we actually found that we did not have quite enough DPS to take out the Hikanta Tyrannos because we were mostly in Covert Cloak uh, drone ships, and having drones chase uh, a drifter is really not terribly effective. Uh, we also actually got some mysterious soul-crushing lag when we were warping in, so that wasn't fun. But anyway, so as everyone's dying in a fire, Lucas Raholin is like, fuck it, I'm going to burn to Tukos' body and try to scoop it. Uh, apologies for the, uh, the French there. So anyway, he burns the body, discovers, of course, that it's an LCO and can't be scooped, warps out. Everyone's like, ah, well, that sucks, okay. What we uh, are uh, able to find later is actually that there was a proximity trigger on Hilan Tukos' body that put a cerebral slice in the cargo of the first person to get with some short distance. At which point, shenanigans ensued, 
and uh, we did a scientific analysis of the, uh, uh, the slice, which CTP gave us a wide degree of latitude on. And basically, it was determined that a brain scan had been done, as happens when a capsule is breached, but it was anomalous in some ways, and obviously his medical clone didn't activate. At which point, of course, then we got into uh, further shenanigans with Concord demanding the slice back, and naturally Lucas was very attached to it as a trophy, and also because, well, hey, it's the only Hillentucos brain slice in existence in the game. However... However, then uh, the demands went from uh, very threatening to very threatening in public, and bounties were threatened to be placed on uh, the pilots involved in the formation of the expeditions, the retrieval of the slices, and the analysis of the slices, uh, to the tune of 150 plex total, which is mildly large. Yeah, it's, it's worth noting that this wasn't using the normal bounty system. This was literally like, whoever brings me the head of Lucas gets 50 plex, which is not something that we've really seen before. That I can C C that I can CCP did it once before with the, but it wasn't with players. They they put a plex bounties on the heads of a bunch of octopus squadron renegades, uh, basically a bunch of provosts. Um, this was a while back. Uh, the um, Tybus Heths Tybus Heths uh, faction of loyalists stole a bunch of cap ships uh, from the state when they fled and. Uh, then the Caldari Navy and Concord put up bounties for them, and there were just a series of kill the cap ship events. Right, but but the point is, is that like there was a, for lack of better words, kind of an oh shit moment when this came down because the this letter, this public out call was kind of one of the the most real moments of like the the division or the the fusion of in-game mechanics and the lore that we've seen in a long time. In other words, uh, there is very real consequences being applied to players based on lore kind of events. Um, in particular, not only was there that Plex thing, but there's also an actual security standings change that was being threatened alongside that, which standings change, changes for lore reasons haven't happened since the Sancha live events, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And it's also worth noting that uh, what did cause uh, Lucas Raholan to surrender the brain bit is that he essentially received an order from uh, the Imperial Chancellor. And so, you know, props to him for being true to his character while he would, you know, spit in the face of uh, Odo Karachi when the Emperor says, give him the bit, he gave him the bit, which was it makes me really sad. Yeah, the same here. I really was looking forward to uh, doing hilarious things. Escape and evasion. It would have been very interesting. So, so has anything come from this since then? They, I know that they put out they put out a blog post where they said that yes, this was in fact his brain bit. Um, but uh, has anything else, like lore wise, come out from that, or has that arc kind of gone quiet now? To our knowledge, that arc is concluded. Uh, basically, Concord got the bit, they buried the bit, or put it into a black box, and now we just wait to see what happens with the Drifters. So okay. it's also um, it's really important because, and I'm sure you're going to correct me, but I, up until this point, have never heard of a capsuleer transferal failing spectacularly like this. Um, has that happened in the past? It theoretically does happen. They actually hint at it really broadly, especially in the GTA 4.4 Chronicle. Um, there's a number of different places that you can see references to the danger of it happening, even if we don't hear about it a lot in-game. Okay. Um, that's interesting. So so this is something that can happen, but I, I, I just, I feel like as far as like telling us telling a story goes the reason why this thing would happen is that uh, you know with with we, we've recently discussed things like permadeath with an eve and you know there's there's been some conversation about that kind of stuff i find it very interesting that as we're kind of ramping up this story about the drifter threat um our our very immortality has been kind of called into question indeed though it's worth noting that ted's failure is sort of implied 
Uh, we know that the burn was successful, and we know that his medical clone at Ifear, or, well, we suspect that his medical clone at Ifear did not activate. The implication, then, is that the transfer wasn't successful, but it could easily be that the drifters simply interfered with the transmission. It could be that they suborned the transmission and received his mind state instead. It could be that his medical clone did activate and then was taken away to the sanctuary so that they could question him extensively about the drifter hives. There are any number of options. Yeah, there's that unnamed Eifer employee. Who is still, to my knowledge, locked unnamed. away somewhere. Then yeah, that there. could could easily be the legal repercussions of um, his leaking the broadcast. It's either theft or it's espionage or it's both, and they may have determined that, well, Scope wasn't really culpable, we can't really push that, but this guy totally stole the thing, so lock okay. him away and throw him away in the dungeon. All right, I'm going to, uh, Uriel has triple X'd, so I'm going to put him in front and then jump to Samari, Samiri and then throw some of my thoughts in. Uh, talking about, okay, yeah, so talking about um, Tukas being dead, uh, it's interesting to note that the, his quote-unquote final broadcast was, uh, date, it's now known to be dated uh, before when his broadcasts on the Intergalactic Summit came out. So it was after that happened that the weird fake Tukas asked about the Joe Farts, and after that still that he said he had been captured and that he's coming back. So if he was dead, he floated there among all of those drifters for a very long time without being picked up. Well, the other, the other idea is talking about his infomorph being interfered with. Remember, Jamil was... The other was inserted because they somehow interfered with... Well, her inter, infomorph was interfered with. Right. It's not a stretch to say that Tukos might have been taken by the drifters. His body is certainly gone, but his mind may still be around. And or they may both. And remember, I remember, he said he, in the thing what we can best discern as him saying he'll be returning in a sleeper vessel. And there's an LCO named Sleeper Vessel. And uh, that may be telling, but uh, we'll see what happens. All right, Samari, Samiria? Um, about the, the Tibbs failure, it should be noted that this is a very frequent excuse used to cover up a capsular's death. It happened when uh, Vesera Yanala died. Uh, Tybus Heth and the Kaldari Navy also claimed it was a Tebs failure, and of course it wasn't. She had been deliberately poisoned uh, with the tea ceremony. And in the Chronicle, the capsule and the clone, it is stated that the uh, transfer has a 99.7% chance of success. So when you hear that a, trans a uh, scan has failed, a lot of times it's not going to be an actual failure. I mean, it's it's the same as when you hear of a, a Navy fleet is on, uh, like, ex, like naval exercises. It's often a cover-up for an actual operation. In the case of two, yes. In the case of Tukas, um, one important thing to note is that communication in EVE is quantum entanglement, which means you cannot intercept a transmission that has been made that has actually gotten th to the uh, the fluid router. The only way to intercept transmission is to either stop it before it reaches the the fluid router, which would be like interrupting the, the scanner itself, or it would be capturing or otherwise confiscating the uh, quantum pair on the other side. So what's likely is that if the drifters or whatever have them, they somehow acquired the other pair of the of the uh, entanglement communicator. Otherwise, he would have cloned in a a cloning center in New Eden. And the cloning, most cloning centers are, of course, owned by Concord. And Concord knew uh, the Concord have also stated that they have an unidentified Ifern Co. employee still in their. Uh, in their cells, well, not really cells, but they're interrogating him. So it's, it's very likely that Tukos might not actually be dead. He's somewhere, we don't know where. 
So one of the themes that I've been catching out of this arc is really that separation of mind and body uh, that we experience as capsuleers. Um, there's been a lot of threats about disruptions of communications and kind of the nature of cloning. And of course, with the Jove being back and with the the entosis links, our, our consciousness projections, the uh, mind clash is a consciousness projection game. Kind of the, the, they're really reinforcing this idea that as capsuleers, our brain or like our, our the, the, the information that makes us us, the infomorph, is distinct from the uh, from the body. Now, how much the infomorph experiences while it is pure information as opposed to being manifested in a body is one of the one of the questions that I don't know if we've solidly answered yet. But it sounds like two cuffs might be finding out right now. All right. Um, let's see. Anything else about the two costs incident um, or or this kind of stuff? We have about thirty minutes left, and uh, I would like to get to uh, the Stargate stuff. Although I think that that would be relatively short, and then we can hit up questions and announcements and everything. So. Um, we're actually doing pretty good with time, so go ahead and X up if you have anything to, to talk about. Um, and uh, Makoto, go ahead and shoot. So one thing to note is that uh, EVE Online is replete with uh, very much cyberpunk themes. And so there are questions of what happens to a human or person when they are increasingly abstracted from the messy meatbag that is a body. Uh, so we end up seeing with the drifters the issue of, you know, when transhumanity goes too far and they are completely abstracted from the body. We see with the Jove, sort of, you know, the uh, wax wings flying too close to the sun, and of course we also have the the uh, capsuleer psychosis uh, is the lore explanation for players wanting cruelty and violence, and it's just this increasing sense that life and biomass is cheap. Right. So so cheap that we occasionally drink it. No, no, no. All right. Um, very cool. So I think that that's about it for that. Um, so let's go ahead and touch on the Jovian Stargates. Uriel, you... You have some updated news about what's going on with the Jovian Stargates. Last thing we heard was really the confirmation from the emergent trailers uh, at, at the start of the Caroline Star event, or rather shortly thereafter the Caroline Star event, the uh, Drifter Stargates went offline, um, uh, which was... Jove Stargate. Sorry, yeah, the Jove Stargates uh, went off. See, I just didn't want to say it correctly again so that, that way they can't use the soundbite in their next trailer. That's... <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys so much, CCP. All right, so um, yeah, so the, the so the Stargates went offline. Uh, we know that, but we haven't really heard anything about those Stargates up until just recently. So, Uriel, why don't you tell us about what's been going on? All right, I will. Uh, so, in one of the patches that came for the first patches that came for the Galatea expansion, which is going to be the expansion on August twenty fifth. Uh, we found an entry for, oh, under jump gates for a Jove uh, regional gate, if I remember correctly. Now, the model was not loading and was not working at first, but I, I ended up getting it to work, and its structure is odd. Uh, it's about as long as the, um, as the uh, Jove observatories are tall, and it looks more like a generalized placeholder for now because it's basically made of a bunch of um, concentric arrangements of long uh, or well, varied in length um, uh, just prisms basically they look like shards almost. exactly, exactly. Yeah. and this part of the parts of them are actually broken too yeah so that may actually have something some relevance to how the uh, observatories were originally appearing you know as the giant crystalline structures kind of you know oddly distorted but yeah, these gates, um, they are in the files, and we have no confirmation of them in-game, no indication of what they will be, but they are there, and, well, there are a couple theories about how, you know, the Drifter incursions are going to start. These gates are broken, and, well, we know all the Jove Stargates went offline or were destroyed for some reason. 
Now, it's a scary indication and something I might not, honestly, I'm kind of weird about. But uh, there may be a chance that we will see at least one system in Jove space at some point looking at this. Either that or it's something in K space that is going to be directly linked to the Drifter incursions. Regardless, this is going to be something very uh, import extremely important to the current storyline. And General, you have some two cents to throw in. Yeah, I was going to say, um, in that sort of same game folder where the uh, the model exists, it should be noted that there's actually six different types of debris models as well. So read into that as you will. Are, so are you, are you suggesting that each of the models might be attached to one of the different incursion sites? Is there six different incursion sites? Maybe, but in that same vein, these look like more like individual like pieces. They're large collidable objects. There was also a uh, giant environment cloud entity uh, in the item IDs now. We don't know anything about it either because none of them have a name, but some of them have a description. A very, very vague description at that, but it's a description at best. So there's the massive environment, which seems like it might end up either just being a cloud or actually having an effect within, like in the uh, where you get the damage clouds. And the debris seem are described as being enormous with huge power surges uh, being detected throughout them. So take from that what you will, but that combined with the broken looking Jove gate already is indicative of something very, very important being about to happen. Right, and I'm going to get to you in just a second, Ravis, but I want to ask the question first. Um, just since you guys obviously spent a lot of time data mining, or not data mining, but at least working with data mined information, um, uh, what would be your experience, what would be your professional kind of opinion of how long before this might matter to Tranquility? Like what is usually the... Uh, the rate by which some an asset goes from being something that we first see on uh, Singularity to being used in uh, Tranquility. Would we suspect that this might come out in the next release, or is this look like, or or is usually this kind of thing uh, a release or two out when by the time we first see it? Well, um, with this, the Drifter Incursion stuff specifically, uh, it's already in the journal. Like if you open the journal, it's right there. So. I'm under the impression that this is going to be happening extremely soon, as soon as the uh, thing is released. Well, we if know, not, we know happening before. I'm and not then, talking uh, about the incursions. The incursions right, right, right. are. I'm talking specifically about these gate assets. Do we do, do we right, have right. reason to believe that they're going to rush those out, or or is this kind of those things? And and Makoto said that uh, they they have an answer. So, or they have a guess. So it's worth noting that the Jove corpses and sleeper canopics actually uh, took a, a couple of releases before we saw them on TQ. So assets may appear on CC, which are several releases in advance, but usually when we see it uh, hitting the database on CC, it will be in the next release, usually. So wait, I'm I'm confused. So are you suggesting that you would your bet be that it's coming out in the next release, or do you think it's further behind than that? Um, well, I'm planning on their appearing in the next release because those plans will at least be in place for the next release and the release thereafter. Very well. All right, General Stargazer, what do you got? Well, I was going to say was um, it's it's one thing that we we actually see the the, the type IDs, so to speak, on Sissy. Um, but there's another thing as well that the, the the game files exist, but we can't actually see them as a reference on City. Um, so, yeah, exactly as Macaro was saying, it's sometimes it's normally sort of two releases before uh, what we see in the game files actually exists as a reference item in the universe. If you know what I mean. Right. And 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 do these gates have are are these which stage are the, are these gates at are they at a ready to be released stage or are they still a little ways out stage? At the moment, they're they're just in the game files. They don't actually exist as a type ID that we can reference. I see. And their uh, their texture is currently the same thing as the Jove Observatories, meaning it doesn't work at all, and it's a place texture. Yeah. Okay, well that's important to note. So thank you for answering that question. Let's jump back over to Ravis. Yeah, there's just one other item that I kind of wanted to, to tie out on that uh, that was brought up a little bit is is that this is looking like the crystalline structures. It's looking like the big long kind of. It, it almost is is evocative of the of the towers. 
um, which is a very different thing than what we saw in the FanFest trailer. So in the FanFest trailer, the Jove, they did show one Jove gate that looked very much like a Jove director at kind of gate. So I think the one thing that we can pretty much rule out is that this is an internal gate to gate sort of thing in the Jove space that, that we have on the map. This is much, much more likely to be something that's tied back to the drifter Jove uh, and is tied back either to the drifter incursions or something moving from our space into another space. To be fair, though, the Jove gate that they used in that trailer wasn't actually a Stargate. It was a bunch of cobbled together Jove ships uh, from the old uh, models with That's a Stargate true. effect put in between them. That's so what true. we're seeing here is not act. What, what we saw there was not actually a Stargate we've ever seen in game because it wasn't a Stargate. Uh, what Correct, we're seeing now, style... we don't really know. Right, but the style was the old style. They didn't even yes. use anything that was the new style. They could have done it with two drifter gates if they, had they wanted, or two drifter ships had they wanted to at that point. Right. But they intentionally chose to use the old directorate ships for those gates. Um, it's also worth noting that um, just because something is named something in the early files doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it ultimately is. This could be loves one here, here. Yeah. So this, this could, could be very a huge well be. Well, actually, I was thinking that you were talking earlier about how Drifter, um, uh, the uh, the sorry, the listening posts have six stages of destruction. This might just be a piece to a further stage. Like this might by stage five, it might be broken up this much or have these pieces hanging off of it. Right. But uh, Mikado, you you have something to say about the Jove gates? So, a uh, quick mention here. Even though the Jove have had stations and ships in the data files, which were unfortunately uh, deprecated a while ago and so are no longer in the database, they never had a Stargate. For the 12 years uh, that Eve has been active, the fact that we are seeing a Jove Stargate in the files is unheard of. So that's a fun side question. Um... Because the map did show gate links within uh, within Jove space, because that's how we knew that the Jove stargates went offline. So I wonder how they mechanically did that in game to make those links there to be in the map. And they then just used other them. stargates. Oh, okay. So there's like Caldari stargates in Jove yeah, space yeah. or something. Okay. Most of, uh, the, most of the stations over there are mixed race anyway. Um, only the Prosper Vault in SeaTac uh, E1. Whatever, whatever the hell of the system is, the Prosper Vault. Um, that's that's actually. I don't think it's a you necessarily a unique station. In I think there's more than one that use it, but there's not very many that are outright, very obviously Jove stations. Yeah, there's one in there's one in MFD TD as well. It's a uh, Academy of Aggressive Behavior plant or something, whatever. All right, so I'm going to have one of these moments where I have to ask this question, um, which I hope is the question that a lot of people are asking, which is, how do you guys even know that? Like, what occurred to allow you to know what this, what the stations are in in a system that we don't go to? Uh, to show us. info on the on the system. I mean, you can all the all that stuff is easily accessible in the game. Okay, well that fair enough. Uh, Got it. As for the Prosper Vault in particular, I think we know that that was from the incursion events when a player named Mouse Nell you know, emote slash put a probe through a worm, Sancha wormhole and CCP responded by putting up this picture with a giant ass Sancha fleet on the other side in front of the station. Right. I remember that, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't remember them ever saying what exact system that was in. No, no they, they they, we, yeah, I think they did. And we, I really believe see. players would have, yeah, people would have identified it eventually anyway. Fair enough. Uh, Mikado, what do you got? Uh, it's actually been covered. All right. So uh, that's that's pretty crazy. So there's there's new stuff in the in, uh, in the files. They are currently listed as Joe Stargates, um, and um, they obviously are causing a lot of um, questions. So does anybody have anything else for that topic? Oh, Mak Makoto, what do you got? Okay, sorry, I just thought of a new thing. So it's worth noting that though we do see uh, Stargates in the files, as has been said, we don't know exactly where they're going to appear, when they're going to appear. It could be associated with the Drifter incursions, or they could be appearing in the regions adjacent to Jove space, which is to say that, in theory, the Jove had burned all the bridges leading to their space after Bakatioth. It's entirely possible that uh, we will find these old gates. So those are the two potential methods of introduction that I would see. Okay, so um, I'm going to... Uh, I on that, on that, okay, go. On that note, there, 
actually is a Nullset Cosmos site um, out in Vale of the Silent, um, where, I, if I remember correctly, the eventual punchline, so to speak, of, of the entire Cosmos constellation is there's an old deactivated gate to Job space. Um, I haven't personally run through all of that. Um, I might do it at some point on CC just because effort to deal with the, the locals on TQ. <laughs> um, but they definitely did have gates and, and stuff to their space that were deactivated and Veil of the Silent, this one particular constellation, one sec, uh, was um, ETAC 8 CSQ. Um, there, there was a gate there. All right. So, so we have seen gates that leap lead to Jove space. We don't. Uh, you don't know whether or not that was a unique model or anything. No, I. I don't think it was a unique unique model. As far as I remember, it it was that it was an old, deactivated, or destroyed gate. Um, it's very close to Jove space on the map. Um, I think it's uh, the clo- there's right now. There's a ten of ten site in G five. Um, and but there's two Jove systems that are very close, N dash and N dash F and R dash G. Um, so, all right. So, um, thank you for that. I think we're going to be uh, getting ready to wrap up. Phi, uh, have you? Co- do you have any other questions or anything that you've collected uh, for our panel? I do not. All right. Well, if you have any questions for our panel, uh, now is your last chance to ask them in chat. We'll we'll collect them together. Uh, before we go into that, I do want to say. Um, uh, CCP Falcon earlier in uh, the Twitch chat pointed out that uh, neural ba- brain failure um, uh, going back to that topic with Highland Tukas and the, and the neuron, uh, the, the brain failure or the brain scan failure um, that that actually played a bigger part in the backstory um, back in the day. Um, in fact it was the original justification for players quitting the game was that they're their their caps their their pilot just failed to burn and so they're gone now um or at least like that like our concept of biomass now used to be, apparently be um a neural brain failure according to uh ccp falcon in the chat so thanks for pointing that out in that particular case that he linked it was also that a player had died in real life oh and okay in, in that particular case it was someone in veto who had had died and they made a short news item about it Oh, okay. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, I must have misunderstood what he was saying. All right, so um, I guess I'm going to kind of open this up for general tinfoilery and uh, whatnot, and then we'll wrap up in about, uh, we'll do final wrap up in about three minutes or, you know, in a few minutes. So does anybody have any um, anything that they want to discuss or anything that you feel that might not have been touched on enough or whatnot? Otherwise, we can wrap this up early. Go ahead, Ascentor. Uh, so I've got a couple of things that I want to touch on. Um, we mentioned earlier about the drifter incursions um, and how uh, it looks like at least we're getting them in high set. Um, and we uh, spoke about the channel earlier. I just want to point out that that's not just for um, Amar loyalists. The idea is that uh, we want to try and get everyone involved uh, to be working together. Um, also, I'd like to do a big shout out to uh, the fleet commander that helped destroy the drifters uh, in that incursion in Safazon. So, thank you to uh, fleet captain Eldrith Shutak from Pi Inc. And one last thing you all heard uh, Samira Kerner speaking a lot earlier. She's obviously very knowledgeable about law, um, she knows a lot about Amar's history as well as the rest of the cluster. Um, we're all very proud of her at Pi. And as such, we want to uh, give her the new title of the official librarian of the Pi Alliance. Ooh, shiny. Congratulations, um, Samira. Uh, I, think, I think you might have wanted to say that for the shout out portion of the show, but thank you. I'm sure that can be edited. After. Well, actually, um, I think I think that it's about. I mean, we're transitioning into that period, so let's let's just go into final thoughts, and we'll just consider that your final thoughts. So that's very cool. Um, if you want to say anything in response, um, go for it. Uh, I don't have anything in response. Uh, just thank you, I guess. No speech. Uh, All right. Well, make sure to demand no, a medal. No speech. 
All right. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to go down the list and give people an opportunity for final thoughts um, and wrapping up, and then we'll do announcements, and then we'll be done. So I'm just going to go down the, the list as it is in, in Mumble. So um, Fi, any final thoughts that are not our announcements? Uh, no, I just, uh, well, I, yeah, I do want to say uh, thank you to everybody who is so enthusiastic about the return of our lore panels after almost three months. Um, we love you guys, and uh, and we're doing this for you as much as for us. Very cool. Uh, yes, and I, I definitely uh, I definitely agree. Um, you know, seeing people's response to this has always been the thing that, you know, motivates us to keep doing it. The first time it was like, wouldn't it be cool if we just got these people together and just talked for a little bit? And then people actually liked it. So they keep coming back. And as long as you guys keep liking it, we'll keep having them come back and it'll be a good time for everybody. All right, uh, General Stargazer. Yeah, I was literally just going to say, um, uh, for those that are interested in um, attending some of these live events, we have sort of reactivated, so to speak, the live events channel in-game, which um, isn't a role-playing channel. You're just free to join it. Um, and whenever there's a live, uh, live events fleet up, we'll have uh, some public fleets up and going, so anyone is free to join them. All right, uh, Ravis. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to uh, everybody in Sleeper Social Club. And uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, Makoto? Uh, firstly, last little tiny bit about uh, some tinfoiling. We have not heard from the SOCT after the Motsi Ratio incident, so I suspect we're going to get a bit more about that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that said, a uh, shout out to Zindi Cred for producing the Drifter Hive maps, which uh, hopefully will be in the show notes. And uh, Isakame Zainu is recruiting, so and thanks for having me on. No problem. Thanks for coming. Um, it's also worth noting that um, since these live events have started happening in particular, and actually I, the 2 cost event in particular has kind of started a disruption of our regular scope videos. We went for several months getting a fairly consistent cadence of every Thursday or Friday we would get a new scope video. They've been missing some weeks recently, and I think that's just because so many things are happening that isn't involved in the videos, or in you know making the videos, like the live events and everything like that. But there wasn't one last week. Um, and the week before that was very not directly related to anything that's going on at the moment. So... Um, we're, we're pretty due for some more information in scope videos, so I expect that to be coming pretty soon. Um, all right, so where was I? Uriel, what do you got? Uh, not much when it comes to shoutouts, other than shout out for uh, Jovian Labs, my corporation, and Jovian Enterprise, the alliance we're in. Uh, also, let's see, uh, well, shout out to the lore team from CCP again for all this awesome stuff that's been going on and I'd also like to mention on the subject of the scope videos uh, it's a personal hope of mine that the reason we didn't have a video this week and I suspect we may not have one next week is hopefully a cinematic trailer possibly for the Galatea release if the Drifter incursions are coming because that would be a very good reason to have a real trailer anyhow uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone and I'm happy the lore panels are back I hate to bust your bubble, but um, I'm also going to point out that it is very logical that the reason why we're not getting as many scope videos is that CCP is on vacation. Yeah, also a good point. All right. Um, okay, so let's see. Next would be uh, Samiria. Uh, I don't really have any shout-outs for that. That's fine. I'm Nobody gonna... has to. Mark, what you got? Uh, not much. Thanks for having me, and thanks to the CCP lore team for uh, doing all this for us. I certainly love seeing all of it. I do as well. Ascentor. Ascentior. I figure I might as well pronounce you guys' names right at least once. That's great. Um, I think I did most of my shout-outs earlier. Um, Pyinx Recruiting, if anyone's interested in getting un involved in Amar role-playing. And... Uh, Good work, everyone, for saving uh, the cluster earlier in Safazon. It, it, it appears um, that 
our lore team wants us to, to read out uh, Jamil's full title. And I'm actually going to hand it over to you, Ascentior, to go ahead and, and read the full title of Jamil Sorum as revealed um, in the, one of the previous events. Everyone bow in respect for Her Holiness, the Defender of Faith, Wielder of the Holy Light, Keeper of the Sacred Flame, Provider of the Almighty Shield, Guiding Hand of God's Chosen People, Shepherd of the Lord's Chosen Children, Smiter of the Non-Believers, Venerator of His Holy Grace, Sovereign of the Imperial Order of the Hound, Ruler of Her Majesty's Honourable Theology Council, Commander-in-Chief of Her Imperial Majesty's Imperial Armed Forces, Sovereign of the Imperial Kingdom of Carnid II, Protector Protector of the Holy Imperial Realm, Commander-in-Chief of the Most Venerable Imperial Order of the Speakers of Truth, Custodian of the Holy Imperial Territories of the Throne Worlds, Voice of Divine Truth, Her Imperial Majesty, Jamil the First. I... Barring <laughs> that shit. Challenge <laughs> issue. I just, I love the shot I get across the bow <laughs> that is against that, you know, Maximilian the First of his name or whatever. Like, no, this is what titles are supposed to look like. All right, so, on, and finally, uh, or Morwen, what do, you, do you have anything uh, for final thoughts? I don't really have any um, shout-outs other than uh, for the role players Among the, the uh, viewers, there is a little Alliance tournament viewing party going on at the Golden Mask uh, next weekend and during the other uh, tournament weekends. Uh, there's an announcement on the IGS. Uh, because the Alliance tournament is next weekend, so I hope all of you guys are going to be watching. I think there's there should be more than just me on on here who's actually flying it. I think, but um, yeah, I would normally give Samira a shout out here, but you know she's actually on the panel this time. So thank you for actually coming out this time around, Samira. All right, and I'm uh, and I'm oh sorry. All right, so I'm going to um, uh, give my personal shout outs and then kind of give the announcement. So for my personal shout outs, thank you so much for. Uh, all of the, the lore panelists that came out once again to talk, especially to our Pi guys who showed up to, uh, to put a lot of this new Amarian stuff into context. Uh, a lot of our older uh, lore panelists are very Jove experts because that was what was very important at the time. And now uh, Amar has decided that they want to be relevant too. So uh, I thank you guys both for coming and helping us put some of this stuff into context. And uh, please, please, please come back again. Um, uh, whenever you can. Um, I also would like to give a shout out to all the people that showed up and supported us and talked in, in Twitch channel and all that stuff. And uh, all of our listeners who have continued to listen to Hydrostatic, um, you guys are freaking awesome. Um, I know that you know content has been slow for the last couple of months as kind of real life and summer is crushing all of us in our own fun and unique ways. Um, we continue to uh, maintain our passion for the uh, EVE lore and the EVE game in general. And uh, we're definitely going to be um, uh, working hard to continue to put the game into perspective for people. Uh, now, on the other note, um, on more kind of announcements side of things, uh, where we are. Oh no, where's the announcements? In the do oh, that found it. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to give a birthday shout out to uh, Arabi Den Denard. And if I mispronounced your name, congratulations, you're just like everybody else. But uh, he, he messaged me earlier, uh, today is his birthday and it happens to correspond to the lower panel. And so uh, he said it would be really important if I gave him a birthday shout out. So happy birthday to you. Um, and he actually will be contracting, contracting to me or has contracted to me a Stratios um, that we will give away um, soon. Uh, now, for the big announcement, which is the whole reason why you guys have been sitting here listening to us for the last two, year, two hours, is uh, that uh, I am pleased to say that it will not be very long until the next time you can waste two hours listening to us talk as a lore panel. Um, our next yeah, yeah, yeah. our next lore panel is actually already scheduled uh, for August the 23rd, which is ironically the day after my birthday. Um, I'm actually cu cutting my birthday short, uh, my birthday party where I'm going out camping. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I'm coming home early just so that I can take part in this lore panel because 
uh, CCP Falcon and CCP Affinity have personally asked us to form our lore panel experts together so that they can come on and talk to us about something that they want to present to the lore community. So we have no idea what's going on. We know that this is two days before the patch, um, but we will, do as, as dutiful custodians of the lore, reassemble on Sunday, August 23rd, and hear whatever it is that they have to say and probably get completely blown away. No. Uh, and, and we will uh, be discussing more of the lore and um, kind of continuing to put things into perspective. So um, if you guys have any questions for our panel uh, that you think of for now or tinfoil theories or anything you have, uh, obviously it's not a lot of time between lore panels. And so um, chances are uh, it'll be interesting to see how that will, will work out because – you know, we had, what, two months worth of content and it filled two hours, so we'll see what happens. Um, but if you have any questions, go ahead and email us at hydrostaticeve at gmail.com. Uh, we're very excited to, to host this. So um, that is our special announcement. And with that being said, it is the top of the hour. So on behalf of myself, Lockfox, Fyridian, and all of our panelists, thank you so much uh, for listening to us. And it's and remember, it's not what SP you have, it's what you know. <laughs>